Uh, we're now going to look at a number of topics and discuss these topics um, to see what the expertise around the table can contribute to them. And I'm going to kick off with something that um, has really been accelerated during the pandemic, but very much featured in the TOPO report, which is the topic of remote monitoring. Now, to start us off, I'll just quote one example. The uh, remote monitoring app, self-monitoring app for women with gestational diabetes, GDM Health, was featured as a case study in the TOPO report. And at the time the TOPO report was published, it had been deployed in seven NHS trusts. One of the advantages being that um, the women uh, whose care was being managed because of their diabetes during their pregnancy would only have to come to hospital maybe one out of two um, clinics. So it would reduce their need for them to go and see their midwives because the management could be done remotely. Well, uh, what COVID actually did is that for obvious reasons, it was decided that as many women as possible should be managed completely remotely. And so what has happened is the uh, take up within the NHS has grown, has grown in those two years from seven NHS trusts to 57 NHS trusts. And um, in fact, some of the clinicians using um, gestational diabetes uh, technology linked to that app um, uh, have demonstrated to their diabetes colleagues. And what happened is a lot of the diabetes colleagues um, have said, look, uh, if you're able to do that for gestational diabetes, why can't we do it for type 1 diabetes primarily, but also possibly type 2? And so the, the company that um, was responsible for the um, product or GDM Health, the app, um, went um, in the summer and started designing um, a version for uh, other types of diabetes, DBM health, and that was really as a result of demand by the clinicians. So the remote monitoring benefits the patients, it keeps them at hospitals, which are dangerous places at the moment, uh, but also the clinicians have completely changed the way they do their clinics in terms of um, remote monitoring uh, the patients or rather than have them come to clinics regularly. And I expect people around this table will all have had uh, some experience of, of that. And um, so I'm going to th throw it open. Who would like to comment in the first instance or discuss the impact of remote monitoring on the NHS in the last 12 months? Harpreet? Thank you, Lionel. So absolutely agree. I think we've seen a, a tremendous progress uh, in the use of uh, remote monitoring across the health uh, and care system. So uh, I'll kind of wear two hats here, one from a kind of policy uh, hat and where we are nationally, but also secondly, as a clinician, we are seeing some really, really important strides that we've made. So um, as a GP now, I'm seeing the use of um, remote wearables and sensors that are helping us monitor things like blood pressure. Um, more importantly, also pulse oximetry uh, because of COVID uh, and also giving us an opportunity through the remote monitoring uh, technology we have to communicate with our patients remotely. Uh, and that's led to a complete change in the way we are consulting with our patients, but also how we manage our patients. And I think it's been beneficial on both sides. So for patients, it's provided them with convenience and, and potentially better experience. Uh, but for clinicians, it allows them to also manage patients who might be at uh, risk of developing possibly COVID or other things if they come and see us, or if, if there's opportunities for them to be safe in, in their own environments to allow them to be managed more carefully and uh, sensibly at home. 
I guess the challenges we still face in this space is that if we look at the wider evidence, it still is quite limited in terms of who is this technology most effective for and where can it really add value. So the use cases still need to be developed and, and, and you know, bring that evidence in, which will allow us to really determine that. Um, and, and that will you know, be based on literacy levels, which Henrietta has talked about, but also the, the area around inequalities, right? So never everyone necessarily has an access to a smartphone, not necessarily everyone has the ability to afford such technologies. And the NHS can play a role in that. And, you know, we, uh, as we, I say we, but in London, for example, there was uh, the purchasing of around 300,000 pulse oximeters that were bought in early days of the pandemic and they were distributed. And, and the NHS could play, most likely play a role in that. But there's this ongoing uh, thing we have to think about around the sustainability of it is that how do we keep financing this, but how do we keep uh, using it in a way that's effective for our patients? Because on top of that, what we also need is a data infrastructure. Um, and, and what I mean by that is at the moment, I know, for example, uh, some of my patients who may have uh, the remote monitoring devices. But if we then multiply that by, by million across the country, you know, we don't have an infrastructure at the moment where those readings can easily be fed back into the GP record or, or come up, you know, in front of the, the primary care clinician unless we reach out to them. So there's no mechanism at the moment. And I think that will hopefully come with the national data strategy that is being put together and the architecture that we are developing. But if we look at it from a, the workforce perspective, it will completely redesign how we interact with those patients that have chronic disease. Um, and, I, and I'm hugely excited by that prospect of it, with the caveat that we are doing it in a sustainable evidence-based way so that we reach to those patients that need it most, but also to those that are being most impacted by it and, and can provide that with that benefit and, and again that was clearly brought through in the um in the topple review with the work that henrietta was doing with inequalities and i think we, we have a part to play on that and i'm hoping that as we build on the success we've seen in the last 12 months we can clearly demonstrate more uh, progressive and beneficial outcomes for our patients patrick and then Rhodes. Thank you. Uh, one thing that was a golden thread through the Topple report was about putting the patient first and thinking about how we gave the um, time back to clinicians to care for patients. And I think the example you gave there, Lionel, about this app is, is a really good one because in terms of way other organisations have shown how digital transformation works, you put the client at the centre, so for the NHS we put the patient at the centre, you do it in a small way and pilot it to test it works and then you go to scale and I think you've got a really good example there where people have tested it, it really has worked in that geography, a few more people have scaled it, 57 trusts have scaled it and now the much wider diabetology workforce is going actually we ought to take this to, 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 to full service. Uh, so a really great example. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Rose to come in now. Maybe Elizabeth, uh, you might want to comment from from the point of view of the patient and um, some of the points have been raised by Harpreet about how patients may um, interact themselves with um, the healthcare service through being remotely monitored. But first, Rose, please. Thank you, Lionel. And I was going to mention that golden thread that Patrick picked up on about putting the patient first. And one of the challenges in the AI and robotics group was thinking about how you create that um, opportunity for patients' data to be used to really improve their healthcare and to improve our understanding across the piece. And, and one of the things that has come through in, in what we've already discussed, but in the increased use of remote medicine, obviously with the pandemic, is that it's really um, given a huge boost to patients' interactions with these technologies. And that's one of the big challenges is not just that you have the technology and that it can do X, Y, and Z. It's the way people accept it or they don't accept it. And I think that's what's really interesting. And as Harpreet was alluding to, that data infrastructure will be 
incredibly important and so useful if we get it right with the increased use of remote medicine the kind of data infrastructure that would allow us to use AI algorithms to start learning some really significant and deeply useful information about different parts of the country, about different trusts, about um, individual patient groups, about diversity, all of those kinds of things. And it really brings home to me the way that one of the really beneficial things about the Topol report from my perspective was the integration of the different perspectives on technology, on genomics, on AI, on digital, on robotics. And this is an example of putting that patient in the, in the prime position and then building around it and building that integration and learning across all of the different interest groups that came together in the top or review. Thanks very much, Rosna. Um, Elizabeth, if you'll allow me, I think Harpreet just wanted to comment on um, one of the issues raised by Rose. So, well, uh, thanks, Lionel. And, and uh, just on that, I mean, not only is it the acceptance, uh, Rose, from our patients, but also from our workforce. Um, and, and, you know, if we look at our more experienced colleagues, um, you know, some of them who may have not accepted it or not seen the usefulness of this technology now certainly do and the ease of the, how it can be used. And I think that, 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 again, is a major step forward because it means now we can explore and experiment with, with new sets of technologies. The other point uh, linked to that is this concept of the, the, you know, the psychology of task shifting, where, where again, colleagues have, have you know, taken a step to give up some of the work they do or redistribute it amongst other colleagues. And I think that's always been a barrier in the past where people feel that whatever work they do is, is really important and no one else can do it. And hence they don't want to let anyone else do it. But now with the fact that we've redistributed the work across different healthcare professionals, it gives us more opportunity and time to, to think about things like this, but also think about how we're redesigning pathways. And so on that clinical workforce perspective, which again was highlighted with, with um, Eric and the team when we did this, was to say we need that headspace to actually make that everlasting change. And I'm hoping that we can build on this further. Thank you very much. Uh, Preet, now, on this topic, um, I'd like to ask Elizabeth to, to close uh, with, as was uh, really a key point in the top of review, the, the patient's perspective. So the patient at the centre, uh, over to you, Elizabeth. Yes, thank you, Lionel. I think it's hard to overstate, actually, the significance of these developments in these difficult times. I can think of two people from the top of my head who are um, have been told that they should go to secondary care to have certain sets of symptoms reviewed, and they both said, we're not doing that under any circumstances at the moment. So that's what the patient community is facing, and that's what the NHS is facing on the other side of that. So I think the remote monitoring is an absolutely invaluable tool um, I think there are just a few things that we need to make sure we've got sussed before um, we go ahead with huge speed with this sort of thing, though, because I think from the patient's point of view, the value of the interaction with the clinician is incalculable. And sometimes you do need that interaction. OK, remotely, yes. And sometimes obviously it can't be remotely. So I think we need to calibrate for a particular condition what part can remote monitoring devices play? What part can remote interaction play? And what part must be set aside for actual physical discussion with a clinician and examination and so on? We mustn't, I think, lose sight of that. Um, I think from the patient's point of view, there are really two things that they need to give them confidence in these sorts of things. One is information at the beginning. What is this bit of kit? How does it work? What do I have to do with it, supposing it doesn't work? And the second is ongoing support, which hopefully, if the first is done properly, the ongoing support will be minimal. But they should have someone that they can talk to and say, I'm worried about this. I'm worried it's not working. I'm worried it's giving the wrong data. I'm worried the GP isn't looking at it. Um, and I think lastly, and, and this is something I think which is very significant to me anyway, in primary care, is about that time. How is the clinician's time going to be spent so that they have time to do the clinical review that they're receiving remotely as well as see the patient when it's required but you know leaving aside those caveats I think this is an enormous stride and it's ironic that Covid with what everything it's putting us all through is giving us this advantage. 
Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, that was really interesting. And I think you raised an interesting point there between the balance between remote and in person. So I, I'd like to pick that up in our second topic. So obviously, with at the moment, it's um, as as indeed you indicated, those two patients uh, didn't want that you knew those two people you didn't know didn't want to go to hospital on any account. So there is a trend that has begun with the pandemic of keeping people out of hospital. It'll probably um, continue uh, even after the end of the pandemic. Um, and so how do we uh, make sure that the balance between hospital and remote consultations is the right one, let's say post pandemic? Um, so we talked about diabetologists managing type 1 diabetes patients uh, remotely. How much of that should be remote? How much of that should be in person? And remote consultations, which were very rare before the pandemic, now take place quite regularly. Um, was there time, and I'm going to ask Patrick to come in to answer this question first, <coughs> Was there really any time uh, because of the pressures on the NHS from uh, last March onwards to develop training uh, for remote consultations for GPs? So, um, Patrick, to take that one, anybody else to address how do we find post pandemic the optimal balance between remote and in person? So, Patrick, training of the workforce for remote consultations. The GP. Thanks, Lionel. I'll ask actually Henrietta to answer that Pacific piece uh, because she's done the work on it directly. But I would say up front that uh, it sometimes takes a crisis to make a move that then once you've moved, you get the engagement which we don't move back from. And I think we've seen that both in primary care and in the acute sector as people have had to move online whether it be through video consultation or phone or what, or even AI supported triage system, uh, triage systems, uh, that the public have now got used to that. And actually, uh, for the greater part, are actually finding that a much greater opportunity because they feel that the service is coming to them and they're in greater control. And I think if you look at our future health service, there's something about the citizen taking back control of their own health care. Uh, rather than the greater reliance that, that we have done in the past since 1948 on our NHS. So for me, that huge opportunity and swing has meant we've moved it. We now need to redress and rethink some of the things that now need to be retrofitted in terms of support for the workforce to make that happen. Part of that is what I talked about earlier about board development. Boards really need to understand the motivations of what infrastructure they need to put in place to make this happen. And they also need to think about the tariff issues about patients now being cared for from home. How much will they get paid for supporting that work um, so that organisations still um, can carry on operating? So I think that's uh, really important. The other thing is to, to check with patients what worked in this change and what didn't work so that, again, from a retrofitting point of view, we can get the digital right. And so it's quite a complex piece from all the way from patient through to board and indeed the people managing the infrastructure to really help us support get that infrastructure right. And we're going to be at this for quite a few years yet before we get it right. But I think now we've got so far we're not going to move back. But the Pacific issue about GP consultation, I'll ask Henrietta to come in on because she actually has led uh, one of these pieces of work. OK, please, Henrietta. But thanks, Patrick and Lionel. I think, first of all, just a comment in terms of your, your point, Lionel, about what percentage of people would like to see through remote consultations or face to face personally and based on conversations with my digital first primary care colleagues it's it's not so much about numbers or percentages it's about who this is appropriate for so i think that's something definitely which again fits with all the the principles of the of the review it's what what's appropriate for who is what or this the patient uh, the patient should be at the center of this decision making process 
having said that, I think Topo for all its faults, we were already in the process of thinking about how we can support the development of the um, primary care workforce in implementing total remote consultations. And of course, with COVID, everything had to rapidly move forward. So we were able to convert existing materials into um, training. In, in a space of two weeks with, with input from our um, technology enhanced learning colleagues to be able to get it out to our GP colleagues in primary care to implement remote consultation. It became rather um, um, clear right from the off that whilst we are getting clinicians to understand what to do, you couldn't actually do the whole the whole implementation without any training for um, ad, um, GP practice admin staff. So again, another area that was identified much earlier on, which meant that we were able to put some training or repository of learning in place for pr uh, admin staff to really understand their role in supporting the full um, remote consultation consultation piece and of course this meant had implications as well for um, care home staff or the care sector so it equally developed some repository for them. I think what's also key in this is fundamentally it's the patient at the end of it and what the education is for that patient. So, I mean, we were talking about this yesterday and pulse oximetry has been mentioned in the conversations earlier by Harpreet. And what we've done is work with colleagues again, with um, Matt Hamilton, who again was a clinical fellow on, on the Topo Review, who developed a, a, a draft document for us to be able to work with industry and convert into a video, a really short four minute video that talks the patient through what they need to do when they receive a pulse oximetry um, um, equipment. I think overall for me it's it's not just training but it's moving uh, um, the sense of where we go with this. We've done this and it's how do we make a stick which is the point that you made Lionel. What we are looking to do is to go back now having implemented it rapidly to fully understand through a discovery research what this process has been for clinicians and identify specific learning gaps or areas that they need us to build on so that we, we have their training all sorted, ready for making it stick really. Thank you very much, uh, Henrietta. Um, Rose wanted to come in and I'll ask um, our pre briefly to comment on the balance between remote and in face-to-face uh, -face consultations post-pandemic. Rose. Thank you, Lionel. A really interesting question. And I just wanted to make a quick point about the parallel with AI in that one of the biggest questions that, that we certainly considered as part of Topol, but that is ongoing within the community is recognizing what's best done by AI and what's best done by humans. And I think that's the key thing with remote medicine as well as with AI. You know, what are the things that really AI is way better at doing or, or remote is way better at doing than we are or allows us to do something we can't do and which are the things that actually are much better held by the human and I think that's fundamental to the way that we look at these technologies in the future and then of course as Henrietta and Patrick have made clear it of course it's led by the patient but then there's the healthcare professionals and then there's the system and then there's all of the implications for each of the players in this piece around training and acceptance. But I think that kind of, what is this helping us to do we couldn't do without and, and enabling us to do more, but which of the things actually, for various reasons, are better held by the humans. And it's a very useful way of looking at the situation. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So Harpreet, um, can you speculate on how we find the optimal yeah. balance the two. Absolutely, um, uh, and, and one for speculating. Um, so look, um, I, I think it's, it's it's hugely critical to to think about this from the lens of, of, of the patient, you know, as well as what the infrastructure allows. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. So we, for example, at the start of the pandemic, went from a complete game changer from doing virtually zero video, maybe three or four telephone to 30 or 35 telephone and video and zero face to face so one extreme to the other and in between we missed a tremendous amount of learning in terms of actually 
who does this really work for and what are the use cases? So, you know, at the start, for example, even before the pandemic started, there was all this discussion and topics around, you know, dermatology is the speciality that will be used for remote consultation because it just makes sense. All you need to do is get your skin image and, and the doctor will diagnose it. But actually, it's proven to be one of the more difficult ones because you never have the lighting, you never have the right camera, or you know, you, you can't make a diagnosis through or a sensible diagnosis through through this. And and so that goes to show that what we may think through our research or through discussion we have in practical terms is not the issue. Now, look, AI, I know there's companies out there who are looking at this from an AI angle, and, and we're still a bit of a, away from that, and we may get to a point that that can help enhance our clinical diagnosis, but but I still think we've got a way to go. So we've now kind of recalibrated to about 60-40, uh, 60% telehealth, uh, where it's digital first for everyone, and then 40% or so about face-to-face. -face. And I think most likely that balance will remain because the complex social issues that we face, in particular in primary care, cannot simply always be managed remotely, right? You need to speak people want to be in front of a, a clinician, they want to be in front of a healthcare professional. And I think we, we have a responsibility for our patients on that basis. On secondary care, however, I think there'll probably be a higher tilt where I think most likely we be probably 70-30, where 70% where outpatients could very easily be done uh, from a telehealth perspective because of follow-up. And especially if you're having a six-month follow-up, you know, if you haven't fallen in within six months of you seeing your doctor or having that specialized treatment, you're not likely to fall ill after that. So that six month checkup that you usually have for 10 minutes, I think can very easily be done uh, on virtual. So that's the kind of balance I think we will probably have. But I absolutely agree with colleagues who, who mentioned this is that the face to face component of this is going to be critical uh, because the behavioral cues the dynamics of how people interact with you, you simply cannot pick up on the phone or, or, or on video. Um, and, and I think we're away, quite away yet from facial recognition or recognition of behaviours of how people are moving through technology. Uh, but until then, we should solidify what we have. OK, well, thank you very much. Now, before we move to genomics, just a very quick final question on a specialised topic in remote monitoring, which was covered by the topo review, which is the issue of wearables. So we're not talking so much um, about Fitbits and so on, but uh, so not consumer items, but actually medical devices. <clears throat> so as yeah. has been mentioned, pulse oximetry has become um, really ubiquitous during the pandemic. There are articles in the Times, the Daily Mail, other newspapers are available. And um, it's uh, therefore the, the case that pretty much everybody understands um, about pulse oximetry. It is actually a wearable device. You put it on, on your finger, uh, although uh, when it's done by patients in at home, they'll probably do it for one or two minutes, not more. Um, but locally here in Oxford, we've um, developed a system um, which we call the virtual high dependency unit, which in fact has been deployed in all the infection wards of the local hospital, whereby we use wearables to monitor um, heart rate, uh, <coughs> rate and oxygen saturation. And in those infection wards, um, we have COVID patients only, of course. And it is very important for COVID patients because it's a respiratory disease to be ambulatory. And therefore, the ambulatory on the infection ward, but using both Bluetooth from the wearables to a computer tablet by the bedside so that the patients can still walk around and there's enough Bluetooth signal strength the information gets to that computer tablet, and then it's used by the hospital Wi-Fi um, to be relayed back to the nursing station, which means that ambulatory COVID-19 patients who are not sick enough, and one hopes they don't get to be sick enough to be admitted to ICU, or indeed who's stepping down from ICU, can be monitored uh, continuously, um, which is an advantage rather than waiting for the nursing observations, but
but also it means that the number of times a nurse has to go and see a patient wearing full PPE has to, uh, can be reduced because uh, they're not directly there with the patients, but they're able to watch them as it were second by second on a console. So that is technology which is now um, being used to, to monitor. Um, uh, it was already nearly 100 patients in the first wave. It's now being used extensively in the current wave. And um, in many ways, it'll be um, it's more or less guaranteed with the numbers of patients that are being to, admitted to hospital at the moment, there will be several hundred. So it has an advantage both for the patient, but also for the nursing staff because it reduces um, their exposure to infected patients. So that's the type of um, technology that now becomes available. Um, uh, almost overnight, we were developing this virtual HDU in another NIHR uh, project, and we're able to adapt it for COVID in about three weeks. So um, would anybody like to comment briefly on the use of wearables before we change over to genomics? Patrick, or oh, Elizabeth first. Yes, thank you, Lana. I just wanted to say one thing really across all these topics. We always said that we would take a very evidence-based approach to all of this if we could. And one aspect of that evidence is patient feedback. Now, in this current crisis, obviously, it's a different matter. But in the longer term, I think we do need some sort of a framework that enables us to get at least sample-based feedback from patients about how they are experiencing whatever it is they've been asked to do, not just assuming that it's all fine for them. Because I think that's, that's a, a dangerous <laughs> approach. So it was just a general comment I wanted to make, really. And certainly on, on wearables, um, I think the same ingredients that I highlighted earlier on of a really good information session at the beginning, backed up with support, gives them confidence. And then once people have confidence, then they're away, really. But I think I think we mustn't lose those elements. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the patients were given the freedom to refuse the monitoring. Uh, very few did so, um, and um, so it became accepted. So the patient was allowed to choose, uh, but it was 90, 95 percent. Um, and as it became more known, then um, it's probably close to 100 percent now. So, but you're absolutely right, the patient has to be consulted. One of the interesting things, the normal monitoring is a kind of active use you know you pick up your phone to use smartphone app or you put the pulse oximeter on your finger in this particular case and this is one of the advantages of wearable it's passive monitoring in other words it's just like in hospital you have a patch on your chest a probe on your finger which is attached to um, a wristwatch um, and so you can you know enjoy daily activities or the activities of daily living without having to stop to do the monitoring. But it is very important to, um, and we have done studies, and indeed our, our first study in this particular project, the virtual HDU, was wearability and acceptability. Um, and we had a number of users, and we changed actually the initial way we were going to do the monitoring based on the feedback. So I think you're absolutely right. It's not just the technology, but it is the acceptability um, and ease of use by by both the patients and the staff. Patrick would you, or Henrietta, would you like to comment briefly? My brief comment on this one is uh, with the demographic time bomb coming in sort of 10 years plus when all those that were born in the 60s suddenly get to an age where they're going to need far more health care then actually wearables is a way forward. We're not going to be able to produce the size of workforce to manage that uh, demographic time bomb. And for me, the opportunity of AI driven wearables that really can support people to remain at home as long as possible, but really catch them before either off their legs, become dehydrated or whatever it might be, or get disease that the wearable might pick up, actually gets them in 
front of a healthcare practitioner when they need to be with the data and get them back home as quickly as possible. I think that is the way to go, but we only have about a decade or so before we're in the thick of it, and therefore a massive, a massive training, both for the people coming through university to recognise this and to recognise the use of AI in the medical devices, but also for us to make sure that they are safe and that through the MH, MRHA and the other regulatory bodies, that we make sure as this kit hits the ground, people understand it both from a workforce and a patient perspective.